All right, so uh, you should hopefully now see the countdown timer. Just I got myself used to this delay because it's about a 15 second delay from what I can see and what you can see. So uh, if you can just give me a shout out in the chat room, those of you who are there, just uh, if you can actually hear the audio, that would be brilliant. Um, if you're not watching this live, then you know the score. Hopefully just jump forward, however minutes you can see on the countdown, jump forward and then you'll be able to watch what actually we did cover when it was live. So if anybody in the chat room can just let me know that you can hear me loud and clear, that would be a huge help. Thank you very much. Cheers, Colin. Thanks for that, mate. And Brian. Cheers, buddy. All right. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot we're going to go through tonight. Um, a couple of new things. I think you see a couple of new things, which is always handy. Uh, but I'll do the usual. We'll do the checks with the audio like we're doing now. That'd be good. Uh, and as when we actually do go... Uh, with my webcam on those of you in the chat room if you can just say that you can see me as well that would be a real handy little thing for me to know um because hopefully this is going to run like it did last week because this new software that's called obs which is completely free does seem to be doing the trick hopefully i don't know if i've tempted fate there but it does seem to be doing the trick and this little stream deck thing i've got now means that i don't have to kind of have my eyes jumping around on loads of different screens trying to see what's working it should just be single button presses should allow us to get everything done but uh ad81 audio is perfecto thank you very much ian munro is in the house the star of tonight's broadcast is in the house <laughs> devs how you doing mark silver Richard Sal, good stuff. Excellent. Folks, while we've still got just a couple of minutes or so, if you haven't had the chance to yet, just, I don't know, just as a quick post on social media, just to let everyone know that uh, we're doing this tonight. That'd be great. Just try and get the numbers up. It's always nice to see there's a, a good turnout. Although I do appreciate it's uh, Friday. And certainly in the UK, we're talking the evening. Europe, we're talking the evening time now. So some people, if they've got a life, I guess, are probably out having a beer. Uh, but us, us keen geeks... We're sat here. We're sat here doing some photoshopping. Um, right. Anyway, listen. I'm gonna I'm gonna dive off just for about another minute and a bit. Uh, as per usual, when it gets to about thirty seconds, you'll hear some music. He says, hopefully, getting louder and louder, and then we'll kick off quick advert, and then we'll dive straight into it. So I shall see you back here in a roughly a minute and a half ish, something like that. I'll catch you soon. Hi, I'm Glyn Dewis and I want to let you know about my brand new book, The Photoshop Toolbox. Now Photoshop is a huge piece of software that is constantly being updated, giving the user seemingly endless creative possibilities. But being such an incredible piece of software can also make it seem confusing and difficult to master. Now the book is made up of six chapters where we start off going through the basics to fully understand layers and then we move on to layer masks, brushes, blend modes, 
with some bonus content, and then a full tutorial bringing everything together in a complete retouch of an image from start to finish. You see, I believe that no matter how much bigger Photoshop becomes, at the heart of Photoshop are three things, layer masks, brushes, and blend modes. If we can learn to understand these three areas of Photoshop, the sky really is the limit. So that's the Photoshop Toolbox, available now. All right, so hopefully you can see and you can hear me. Uh, like I said to those of you who are there during the countdown, if you can just give me a bit of a shout in the chat room just to let you know that you can see and hear me, that would be brilliant. I will occasionally be looking across because I've got like a, a laptop set up over here with what you should be seeing. And to the side of that is the chat room. So hopefully uh, after about a 15 second delay, I'll be able to know whether or not you can see or hear me. But uh, I'm going to carry on regardless, just in case. Um, uh, Brian, yes, we can see you. I'll take it that means you can hear me because you know I asked that question. <laughs> All right, well, listen, folks, Friday, for those of you in Europe, it's obviously the evening time now. So thanks so much for giving up a bit of time on Friday. Those of you in the US, why aren't you working? You should be working now. Uh, but listen, thanks very much for joining me. We're going to go through um, just some parts of the bit a picture I've done recently last weekend when I was in Wales with my friends Ian, Anthony and Brian. And we recreated that kind of 1940s Brigadier picture. Uh, you'll remember seeing Ian with the moustache and all that. We didn't even go for a fake moustache. That was a real moustache. I'll explain about that in a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to go through some of the retouching on that because there's a couple of things I haven't shown and a couple of new ways that I'm doing particular things as well. But listen, that's enough of looking at me at the screen. Let's just dive over to my uh, desktop and then we'll just show you a couple of things before we get into the retouching. So I'm just going to press a single button and you'll be able to see my desktop. All right. So, OK, so that is the picture that we're going to be going through. In fact, let me just dive over to uh, just dive over to Lightroom just for a second. So there's there's the actual picture we're going to be going through tonight, but there's also another picture which I haven't written about on the blog just yet, but I will be doing it because it was a slightly different setup for that, and that's that uh, portrait there of Ian. So two different lighting setups for those particular pictures. This one here that you can see on screen, that will be on my blog next week. Um, I don't know if there will be any reason for doing a live one on that one. We'll see. Um, but you know, we'll have a look anyway. But this is the one we're going to be going through tonight. Now, the idea, first of all, to get where the inspiration for this picture come from, let's just dive over to my uh, website because this gives you an idea of where the inspiration, where the kind of look that I wanted to get for this picture come from. Uh, let's just click on the blog post here. This is my website. Uh, this blog post, if you haven't seen it, just on my website, glyndewis.com, this basically goes through the whole kind of background between behind what kit I used, the lighting setup, you can see here's me, there's Ian, there's Anthony holding two reflectors, that's all explained, the results of the reflectors here, uh, how close Anthony was and how when he moved away, the different look that gave us, and then he got a different view there. But just scrolling back up, these pictures here, this gives you an idea of where my inspiration came from for this picture. And there's a couple of things which are really significant when we look at these. Incidentally, this one here on the far left, that's my granddad there, who was uh, Normandy in uh, World War II. Uh, but one thing you can notice about these pictures here, and this is something that was really popular with that uh, portraits that were done in that era, was the fact that you'll notice that they're not looking at the camera. So they're actually looking across the camera or actually looking to the side of it. So they're never looking straight down the lens. That's one thing. Another thing is the fact that if we look at these pictures, uh, and I guess my granddad's is kind of like that, although there's quite a hard light on my granddad there. I just wanted to put a picture of him in there, to be honest with you. But if we look at these other two pictures here, this kind of follows suit, the fact that you'll notice that they're not really high contrast, okay? So the blacks aren't really deep black and there's no really strong, powerful kind of highlights in there. So we wanted to create something that wasn't contrasty. And that's the reason that Anthony was originally holding those reflectors so that we actually filled in some detail in those, uh, in those shadow areas. All right, so uh, another little thing before we go into the Photoshop. Now, you'll remember that Ian had this really quite impressive moustache. Now, there is a reason for that, and I, me and Ian have kind of spoken online this week just to so I'd say I'd mention why that was. 
For those of you, I don't actually know if this is a worldwide thing, but it's certainly a UK thing. It's something called Movember. And every year in November, you're going to get guys who are brave enough to do it, like Ian, to grow a moustache. And it's all in aid of raising awareness and raising money for prostate cancer. All right, so that's why these, you know, why people do this. So uh, here's the website. I'll put the links to this in the description part of the video that you can actually donate should you feel the inclination to do so towards research uh, and also care for folks who have actually got this kind of, um, you know, terrible disease of prostate cancer. That's so. That is why Ian was brave enough uh, to grow the moustache. It just so happens it was perfectly timed with the release of Bohemian Rhapsody. But the least said about that, the better. All right. <laughs> anyway, right, come on, let's get over to uh, the Photoshop. We'll kind of break this down. There are a few things I want to go through. I'm just going to move my camera out of the way because I can't see my screen. Um, all right, so first of all, I guess the best thing to do is to go through the layers to give you an idea of what all the layers have done. You can see there's not actually that many that have gone into getting all this finished off. But let me just hold down the Option key and click on the background layer. That will take us to the stage where the picture would have come from Lightroom. Those of you who've seen what I've done before, I don't do horrendous amounts in Lightroom. We're talking, because uh, I use the gray card, we set the white balance correctly, uh, lifted the shadows, reduced the highlights a little bit, a little bit of sharpening, lens correction, profile corrections, and what have you. That's pretty much where we get to there. And I know there's so much more you can do in Lightroom, but I'm just a Photoshop person through and through, and that's where my comfort zone is. Okay, so just going through these groups here, we first of all got where the bottom layer on the right here is the tidy up the uniform. And if I zoom in, you'll be able to see what that basically is. Now, this is an, an authentic uniform, which we got from a company called uh, Marigold, uh, based in, in Wales. Big shout out to Lynn Marigold, and also a huge thanks to Ian and Anthony. Ian for going down and getting all measured up, and Anthony for collecting it and whatever. Brilliant. I had a good chat with Lynn this week. But we can see here, there's always certain little things that we need to tidy up. Nothing major on this one here. Can you see how the ribbons here, the metal ribbons, they definitely needed kind of tidying up there. And that's just a simple bit of cloning and what have you, just to kind of straighten out the actual lines in between the ribbons there. So nothing earth shattering there, but it definitely, definitely needed doing. Now, after that, there came the tie color. You can see how we've changed the tie. We're going to cover that in a moment. Uh, the next layer up, if we zoom in, didn't do much to the eyes on this one. Normally, you'll see me really kind of uh, changing the color and stuff. All I did here was just sharpening, sharpening on the eyes. And that was just done using the sharpening tool that you find over in the toolbar on the left hand side. Then I've reduced the shine on his skin. Done a little bit of dodging and burning. Let's just zoom out so you can see that there. A little bit of dodging and burning. We're not going to go through all these steps. I just want to run through just to show you what the bits were. Skin blemishes. Now, a bit of skin smoothing. Now, I've actually done two versions of this picture. And tonight, you're going to see my preferred way that I've worked on this to smooth it all out. Because there is something else about the skin that I'll show you in a moment that was really kind of noticeable in those old 1940s style of portraits. Then we've got the colouring. And then we've got the final look that was given to it there. If I just double click and you can see that's the final look. But let's now duplicate this because I, I want to leave this one alone so it's not, not affected. And we'll just go create a copy. And what I'm going to do first of all, I think because uh, Anthony wanted me to show this, let's get rid of everything up to the point where we get to here. So uh, for this little bit here, one thing I wanted to do was just, I remember I sat in the kitchen at Anthony's house on the following day. Um, having a bit of toast and a cup of tea and I was just tinkering showing him how I was going to work on the tie because the tie here what you'll notice is that the actual uh, in fact if you look at pictures of the olden times the ties this one here is silk now the military ones they're more of kind of like a, a very tightly woven wool and this one here because it's silk it just doesn't seem to match in so I wanted to create the look that it was going to kind of match into that how it should have done originally now you'll see uh, here we also had to do a little bit of cloning to tidy out the gaps on the tie here slap wrist there we should have done that at the time but hey we didn't so a little bit of cloning but I'm going to show you how we can get that texture and also change the color of the tie so it matches more in with uh, with what we want for this final picture here. So I actually quite like the texture on this jacket. And it's this texture here that we used or I used on the tie. So let me just show you how I'm going to do that. I'm going to click on the background layer. Then I'm just going to get my lasso tool. And I'm just going to make uh, grab some of the texture from this kind of area just here. Then I'm going to press Control or Command J on my keyboard 
to copy that texture you can see it just there onto its own layer and i'm going to put that at the top of the layer stack now when you're doing that if you wanted to move a layer within the layer stack you can click on it and drag it up and down but you can also hold down the control key on your keyboard or command and then use the right or left square bracket keys so the right square bracket key moves it up left one can move it down no matter what layer you want if you hold down the control key and click on those little keyboard shortcut there the left and right square bucket keys you can move the layers up and down the layer stack so I like to do that all right so now that we've got that texture let's drag it and put it over the tie like that let's just stretch it out just a little bit didn't grab a big enough bit something like that and then what we're going to do is we're going to use a blend mode now we're going to go from normal let's just choose one at the moment we'll go for something like overlay and you can see when we first of all do that it's kind of it's very contrasting and also the color is just a little bit too funky it doesn't just doesn't look right and that's because the texture that we've put on top of the tie already has a color i find when i do this if i first of all get rid of the color in the texture then change the blend mode it just seems to look much more natural and much more realistic so let's first of all go back to the normal blend mode this texture here that we're going to use on the tie let's just desaturate it so i'm going to go to image adjustments and desaturate so now we've got nice and gray then what we're going to do is we're going to go from normal and we choose overlay or we could choose soft light that's not so contrasty or we could choose hard light now i actually quite like hard light if you see the difference on the tie can you see already how that texture is mapping onto the tie we just need to get rid of this excess so what i'll do is i'm going to hold down my alt key and add a black layer mask so hold down the alt key click on the layer mask icon that adds a black layer mask and hides the texture so now i can get a brush with a white foreground color 100 percent opacity and then i can come in and i can paint it back onto the tie i'll find that a quicker way of doing it as opposed to trying to paint it away i'd rather paint it in so let me just bring this up just here like this i'm going real quick okay some people might think well don't you need because the tie is all kind of twisted and whatever don't you need to distort the texture as well i'll be honest with you that's entirely down to you but i didn't i didn't think the need to do that it's such a small detail uh you don't really notice the fact that, that texture is going to be not necessarily following the line of the tie but i think if you just look at that there that looks like it does anyway doesn't it let's just get rid of this excess at the bottom like so so that's the kind of thing we can do there so a little bit at the top actually let's just get a white brush and we'll just add that in like that all right something like that that's pretty good okay so how can we change the color if that doesn't look quite right for you well all we need to do is go to the adjustment layers in the top right hand corner i'll choose something like a hue and saturation adjustment and i'm going to add see this little icon at the bottom here this clipping mask i only want the color i'm going to do now to affect the tie i don't want it to affect everything so if i click on colorize can you see how it's affecting the whole picture i only want the color to affect what is directly beneath this layer so what we're going to do is just add a clipping mask this little icon here so now you get this little arrow saying i'm only going to color what is directly below me on that layer there so now we can come in you can see we can use the hue and that will kind of just change it to what we want so something like this let's just change the hue to around about there let's kind of desaturate that just a little bit and we can darken it maybe a touch as well something like that there we go so you can see we've put those two into a group there we can go we can change that straight away when you do that you notice how wrong that tie looked being silk we can go from there there rather to there there to there all right so that's how we did the tie there that's for anthony if you didn't like it to be too strong you can reduce the opacity as well but that's how you can start to make that tie kind of match in all right so that's that bit there right what's the next bit i was going to show you all right so let's just get rid of that and go back to the picture here all right so the next thing i wanted to show you was the actual how i worked on the skin in fact it's probably the best thing to do is just go over to my website or go over to the internet again and here's pinterest all right so i've gone on to pinterest 
Uh, it would work on overalls as well. Anthony, yes, it would. Uh, I don't know what that's about. All about. Um, all right. So what I've done here, I've gone to Pinterest, typed in 1940s army's por army portraits, and of course. You're going to get loads of different kinds, but there's just a couple in here that I want to show you that really do. In fact, there you go. There's this highlights what I'm trying to trying to uh, show you. It's quite small, but can you notice with this portrait here how the skin is very very even? It almost looks like it's been smoothed. All the different um, skin tones have all kind of been smoothed out, and it's a really common look to pictures from that particular era. You can see here as well how the skin tone is all very, very even across. You've got obviously the highlights and the shadows, but the actual tone of the skin is very, very even. And that's something that I wanted to do with this picture of Ian. In fact, let's have a look at a couple more here maybe. Um, I, guess, I guess you can actually, you can actually see here, look. See how the skin tones, there's no real obvious patches where there's different tones in the skin. So how did I do that with Ian? Well did that using frequency separation in the second version of this picture I've done. So let's just take, get rid of all these layers here and get to the stage in the retouching where we're going to work on the skin texture, all right, or the skin smoothing rather. Now you can see here, um, Ian's kind of uh, naturally got different textures to his skin. There's different kind of tones in certain areas, different patches where some kind of the uh, skin tone doesn't necessarily flow. Like, let's say here on his cheek, you can see a darker patch there, a lighter patch there, and so on. So I want to try and smooth that out to match in with the look of those 1940s pictures. And I'm going to do that using frequency separation. Now, if you've seen any of my videos before, you'll probably remember there is a certain way that I do frequency separation, but I'm actually going to do it a little bit differently now, all right? Now, there are so many different ways you can do frequency separation. This particular technique, or this particular method of doing it, I find worked better for smoothing the tones within the skin. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to, first of all, Ian Monroe, be careful, Glyn. <laughs> first of all, I'm going to create a merge layer to the top of the layer stack. So that's shift Control alt and e or shift command option and e And I'll create a copy of that one as well by Command or Control j So we've got two copies here of our picture. The first one, let's just rename that one to Blur. And the next one up here, I'm going to rename this one to Texture. All right, so let's turn off the Texture layer and click on the Blur layer. Now, all I'm going to do here is go to Filter, Blur, and Gaussian Blur. And all I want to add in, let's just take it down to really low first of all, is just enough blur. Now, you can see I'm using a pixel radius here around about 5. Um, just a little bit more, maybe seven, just to kind of smooth out the skin. So as we do that, we do start to blend those tones in. They sort of mix in together, and they're not quite so obvious. So maybe seven, or I'll go for eight, something like that. You can see that around this area here. It's all blending in a little bit more. So that's all I need to do for the blur. Now let's turn on the texture layer. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the Image menu, and we're going to go to Apply Image. All right, so in here, we've got this dialog box that comes up. The source is the name of the file that you're working on. Layer, channel, we've got all this kind of stuff going on. Now, where it says layer, I'm going to choose the blur layer that you can see over in the layer stack. So at the moment, it says merged. Let's try and find the blur layer just here and choose that. Now, the reason I'm choosing that is we're using apply image. I basically want to take the contents of the texture layer away from the blur layer. So I've only got texture on this layer. So I can work on the texture or the skin smoothness completely independently of each other. So if I wanted to reduce or increase some texture, I can do that without affecting the smoothness of the skin. Or if I wanted to work on the color, which is all on the blur layer, where we've all blended it all in together, I could do that without affecting the texture. And that will all become clear in a moment. But I want to use the blur layer there. The blending mode is subtract, all right? Because I want to take away the contents of one layer from the other, so I'm going to use subtract. The other two things to note here is where it says scale. These two numbers, 2 and 128, just take my word for it, put those in. They're mathematical. I didn't come up with them, somebody else did, but they work. So two for scale, offset of 128, and click OK. The next thing we need to do is change the blend mode of this texture layer to linear light. Now when I do that, you'll notice that nothing seems to have changed, and that's what you want. If you see a change at this point, something has gone wrong. But let me show you now how we can use this. I can actually affect the color 
or the smoothness of the skin without affecting the texture because we want to maintain texture for the realism. I'm going to click on the blur layer. Let me look show you how I can smooth this area out here so it then matches into that look of the 1940s pictures. I'm going to get my lasso tool and I'm just going to put a selection around that particular area of Ian's face just there. Now what I want to do when I do this I want it to blend in naturally so I need to know how much to feather this particular selection. Uh, and it's pretty hard to guess really how much to feather it. So what I tend to do is I press Q on my keyboard to go to Quick Mask. And this red overlay now shows me the area that I've been that I've selected. And as I zoom in, you can see it's got a very defined outline to it. So I can kind of see now how much I would need to feather this selection by actually blurring it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Filter, choose Blur and Gaussian Blur. And I can dial in. You see, as I bring up the blur, can you see the outline of this quick mask area here softens down? And I think around about, let's have a look here, eight. Eight looks pretty good. So I know now that the outside of this selected area here, if I feather it to eight pixels, it's going to be really nice and smooth and blend in. So I'm going to cancel that now. Come out of quick mask. There's my selection. At the top of the screen now, I'm going to change the feather to eight pixels all right so now i know when we when i use the lasso tool it's going to blend in and look really natural all right so now watch this i'm going to go to filter blur and gaussian blur and i'm going to bring up the radius let's just go to around about there now look if i turn this on and off there's before there's after before after can you see that? Can you see how it's smoothing it all out? Here's the before. We've got this dark area of skin, the light area of skin, the dark area of skin where the tones aren't matching in. But by just adding in a little bit of blur, I've got 18 pixel radius of blur here. And there you go. See how it's smoothing it all out. Now you might think, well, why don't you just kind of apply that to the whole picture? Well, to be honest with you, different areas of the skin require different amount of blur. So you wouldn't want to apply it in the same amount over everything. So what I'm going to do now, just very quickly, is I'll isolate different areas of the face, this area on his forehead, and I'm just going to quickly blur that to try and help it to smooth out. That one there looks pretty good at 18. Let's try over here. There's some areas in here that need smoothing out a little bit. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. That's actually looking pretty good at 18 as well. Let's go down to here. And you can see how very quickly you'll start to smooth this out and the tones of the skin all start to look really smooth but very natural because we're still keeping that texture. Let's just do this little bit here. Let's just go into there. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Can you see that before, after, before, after. See how that smooths it all out and it gets rid of all those uneven areas? That's not picking on Ian, that's all of us. We've all got these uneven areas. All right, let's come down here just a little bit. Into there. I'm appreciate that the, the chat room's kind of moving around. I'm just going to uh, get to a certain point and we can actually dive into the chat room in a short while when there's an advert on. I can check it. But I just want to go through this particular point here. There's before, after, before, after. I wonder if we can increase that one just a little bit more. Let's have a look at this. If you go too far, you'll start to notice like a different change. You start to see it getting a bit darker. So I think about 23, that kind of works just there. All right. So you can see how you'd work your way around the whole picture doing this, just choosing areas that you want to smooth out. Filter, blur. Oh, that works really well. Look at the chin just there. There's before, after, before, and after. Excellent. like that a lot. All right. So... Look at this area just here. Let me just turn this. I'm going to put these two texture layers and blur layer into a group. And we'll call that one there FS, frequency separation. And you can see now there's before and after. That's just very quickly before, after, before, after. And if you think that's too much, all you need to do then is just lower the opacity just a little bit. But that there really does help to smooth out the, uh, the skin tones. It's great for beauty retouching as well. Uh, I'm using this purely to recreate that 1940s skin that you see on a lot of these military portraits. Uh, but there's before, after, before and after. Fantastic technique, frequency separation. If you want me to do a separate video on that, take it nice and steady through all the, all the little steps, just drop me a comment in the actual uh, comment section there or the chat room and I'll definitely get that done. Send it out to folks on the newsletter if you're in there. Uh, but let's just zoom out just a touch. One thing I do want to cover with you is the colouring.
completely new way to finish off the colouring with this. But I'm going to take a quick sip of water, I'm going to put an advert on or some little bit of video, and then we'll dive back in and do the colouring. All right, so you sit on the uh, YouTube channel there, there's a bit of a video showing the Westcott switch, all the music and all that kind of stuff, it's moving around. I thought I'd just take a moment to explain a little bit more about it or actually show you it. Uh, you can see I've got some kids here at the moment. I've just finished a photo shoot with my friends, Brian, Ian and Anthony were over at Skint Creative, which is Ian Munro's studio in Wales. Uh, and we've been using some of the Westcott modifiers. This isn't a promo, by the way. Uh, but it's just to show you, because you'd have seen me mention about the Westcott switch, certainly on my blog with the behind the scenes stuff that I've been posting. And this is basically what it is. Here I've got a, um, this is a light, an Elinchrom light. I think it's the ELB 1200. It's a portable light, hence why we've got the portable, portable battery pack. So we can use that on location. The great thing about this bit of kit here is, there's also this new thing, which is a dock, which means that I can actually take off the battery off the top like that and then slide it on top of the dock, which can then be plugged into the mains, meaning I can use this light indoors and outdoors. So I don't have to worry about it if I'm using it in the studio and thinking about how much longer is the battery gonna last. So that gives me that flexibility there. But we've been using the studio lights today uh, with the Westcott stuff. We've been using uh, a double XL uh, Octo. We've also been using the small beauty dish here, which is the Joel Grimes branded beauty dish. But the actual switch side of it is this. So on the back of it, you can see that you've got the framework where you actually make the modifier, but the back here looks kind of plain. It doesn't look like there's any kind of adapter for putting your lights on. And that's the reason that you can then, instead of having to buy modifiers for each of the lights that you've got, be it a studio light or a speed light or something like that, you can just buy the modifier and then so that you can use it with everything else, you just buy the adapter. So I use Elincom lights. This is the adapter for the Elincom lights. So all I need to do is just put that as a little switch we can peel that over, drop the adapter in, and then I can put my lights into this. If then I wanted to use, uh, I don't know, maybe go on location, and I didn't have this portable battery pack, I just wanted to use like a speed light, because I have like this anytime, anywhere kit, and I don't really want to be carrying around all the big stuff. I might just want to use a speed light. So instead of using the big adapter here for the Elinchrom, you can actually get the speed light as well. Now this comes in two pieces, so it goes down really small, but the same thing here, this round disc, you're just gonna take back that little notch, drop that in, lock it down, and then you can put your speed light in. You've got a little bracket here, that goes on top, goes through and goes into the modifier. So you can start to see now how you can kind of, rather than buying lots of kit, invest in the modifier, and then all you gotta do is use these adapters to use whatever light you want. So I'm kind of all in favor of not having to spend that too much. I'm, I'm all in favor of getting the best I can for my money so that it lasts. There's a phrase I use called, you know, buy, treat, buy cheap, you buy twice. With this, I'm gonna get the good stuff and then it'll last me longer and longer because I can just use different lights with it as I go on. But uh, this is where you wanna invest in the money. So that's it pretty much. Any of the modifiers you can get for the switch, well, you can use with studio lights and your speed lights, Profoto, any other kind of adapter, any kind of brand of lighting that you've got, you'll be able to get the adapters for it so they can use it with your modifier. And that's it. All right, I was looking at a few comments coming in when we were doing that. Paul Genge, I've got your number. <laughs> uh, also, there was uh, EK Photography. When I was doing that frequency separation bit, uh, the comment in the chat room was that you can just use Control or Command F and it will repeat uh, the last filter that you used. Yep, yeah, totally agree. It's a great way of repeating the last filter. But one of the things about using the frequency separation that I kind of mentioned was the fact that you may find that different areas of the skin require different amounts of blur. So that's why I would go to the filter blur and go the long way round so that I could choose to dial it in. Because you're at the start of it, I was using 18 pixel radius. On the chin, I went to 23. So you kind of vary it. So that's why I wouldn't necessarily do that. But you're dead right. That's how you can use the last filter very, very quickly. All right, so let's have a look at the main bit I guess I wanted to show you, and that's the colouring, because this is something that I wanted to uh, make just a little bit different to give it that kind of look for the 1940s thing. Uh, I'm going to get rid of these top two layers, and this here is the stage where it got to before I added in that final colouring. But this has actually had some colouring in, and that's in this layer group at the top of the layer stack. And I'll, you can see now, if I turn that off, 
that's probably what you're more used to looking like uh, the picture looking like when we were doing the stuff before okay so that's pretty much the same coloring as what it had when it first came out of Lightroom into Photoshop and I'd done all the work on the skin and, and all that kind of stuff uh, now let's just open this group up here this gives you some of the lookup tables that you'll know I like to use but there is another step after this to give you an idea of the lookup tables for this particular look so far if I just double click that'll bring up the properties we had tension green edgy amber and then foggy night those ones I use quite a lot and then the one I then used was one of my own which is called 1940s RAF now that is in that lookup table pack that creative pack 3 that is coming out a week on Tuesday okay so a week Tuesday that's when I'm going to be releasing that lookup table pack and then we've got the black and white adjustment but after this this is when I wanted to then add in that final kind of look so let me just take you through how I did it well, first of all, I'm going to create a merge or stamp layer at the top of the layer stack. And we'll call that one uh, BW because this is going to be black and white. And then I'm going to create a copy of that as well. And I'm going to call this one Vintage. All right. Let's turn off that Vintage layer and click on the BW or the black and white layer. Lots of ways you can do black and white adjustments, but there's been a fairly recent update in the Creative Cloud with certainly with Lightroom and Camera Raw that has some really damn good presets in for black and whites. So that's what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna go now to the filter menu and choose Camera Raw Filter. So that brings up the camera raw. Over on the right-hand side where we've got all these settings here, I'm going to click on this little, uh, where it says profile and color, there's little four boxes, four squares. If I click on that and open them up, we can see now we've got the basic, artistic, black and white, modern and vintage. If I open up the black and whites and scroll down, what's really good is just put your cursor over, you get to see a very quick kind of preview of what that's going to be. But the one I want for this one is a little bit further down, and it's number 11. Now I really like this because the way that the actual, the dark areas are really smoothed out and all kind of makes it look a bit cloudy in these, that's the only way I can describe it really. It can really just seem to make it all cloudy. Uh, that one there, the one number 12 is a little bit more contrasty, but you can see the difference between that. And I really like this, how you can just hover your cursor over and get a very quick preview. But I went with number 11. When you choose one of these presets here, if you come to the top of the right hand side of the screen, you've also got an amount slider where you can control how much or how little of that effect or that preset look you want to apply. But I'm going to go for around about the 90-ish kind of mark, liking that a lot. And then I'm going to click OK. All right, so then the next thing, in fact, what I'll do now is, oh no, I don't, not, don't actually want that vintage layer just yet. Bear with me one second. Let's delete that for a minute. We just want the black and white one because I'm going to bring down the opacity on this black and white layer now to around about 50%. All right, so already we're getting a little bit of that profile look, that preset look coming through, but not too much takes the edge off it just a little bit, gives it a little bit of a vintage look. We've still got that cloudiness that I wanted in the dark areas. So that's looking nice so far. But let's take it a step further. Now I'm going to create another merge layer. All right, so I want to be able to take this now back into Camera Raw. I'll call this one here. This is what we should have done. This is call this one Vintage. All right, so now we'll go to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. And I want the greens on the jacket just to stand out just a little bit more. So I'm going to go to the hue, uh, saturation and lightness adjustments here, luminance adjustments. And what we'll do is, what I, actually, I, I think the actual Lightroom version is better because you get like a targeted adjustment. You don't get that in Camera Raw. But I'm going to bring up the yellows, the saturation on the yellows, just to bring up a little bit more color into that jacket. Get the greens as well, bring up those just a touch like that. It's only really, really subtle something like that all right and then we'll go back to the basic tab and i'm going to take the clarity now and i'm going to bring the clarity down let's just zoom in just a touch so you can see what that's doing just almost adds a bit of softness to it just there take the clarity to minus as opposed to the plus that's what we don't want because we didn't have two contrasty pictures in the 40s let's just soften it down by giving negative clarity just a little bit around about minus 30 something like that and then click OK all right so that takes there you can see there on the jacket see how we've brought up the greens just a little bit on the jacket 
by using that uh, HSL adjustments, targeting the yellows and the greens, and that's brought that up just a little bit there. So we've still got a nice desaturated kind of look. We've got cloudiness in those uh, shadow areas there, and we've also got um, desaturated, but not too much. Now, the last thing I did here with this particular picture, I would now at this stage save it. That would then send the image back into Lightroom, and then I would just do one extra little thing. Now, I'm not gonna do that here, uh, I'll just pretend, just imagine I'm doing this now. So I'm saving it, okay? It's gonna go back into Lightroom, but I'll send it back into Camera Raw. Same thing. So imagine now we've saved it and we're now in Lightroom. All I tend to do then is go to the FX tab here, and then we've got the grain. I love this for the final look on the picture. And for the 40s pictures that I'm doing all the time that you'll be seeing at the moment is I take around about 25 to 30 on the amount of the grain. And you can just see it just adds in some aged kind of look to it. And I love that. And it's also very forgiving when you add some grain onto your picture. It's all very, very forgiving. All right, click OK. Now, I don't know if it's done this on this particular picture here. In fact, it hasn't really. Sometimes you might find that when you are adding color and changing the color into your pictures, you might find in the dark areas you get a, a little bit of the the image almost seems to be breaking down. So you get artifacts, you might get some banding. I don't know if we got that before I added the noise in, did we? Uh, no, we didn't. But if you do start to notice that, if you do see that the fact that you're getting all this kind of uh, breaking down of your image in the shadow areas when you're applying lookup table adjustments and just generally colorizing your pictures. What I found is if you then just create, once you've done your color adjustments, if you then create a merged layer at the top of the layer stack, they instantly disappear. All the artifacts get smoothed out. It just works an absolute treat. I have no idea why that works. If there's any boffins out there that know why, let me know. But if you, if you just create a merged layer at the top of the layer stack, it all disappears. All right, so that's that little thing there. Right, uh, also, I've got just a quick look at the comments. I would appreciate if you run through frequency separation together with the HSL tool in Photoshop. Yeah, I'll do that, Paul Genge. Oh, wow, that's looking so good now. I think the internet was invented, so Glenn could share his skill. <laughs> Paul, you're rowing for sure there, but I appreciate it, mate. Man spread, what are you talking about? <laughs> all right, um, let's just quickly dive back to me just for a second. Bosh. And I'll bring that over here. There we go. Hopefully you don't get seasick. All right, so there you go. How long have we been going for? 37 minutes, that's not too bad. I'm trying to keep these under 45 minutes. Sometimes I go a bit further. It's Friday night. You don't want to be sticking around here for too long, do you? But uh, I will do separate videos for that frequency separation. It's not a technique that I came up with, believe me. It's something that I've learned, and I'm always looking to learn more by going on YouTube, looking at... Uh, other areas that you can get tutorials. I was actually watching Lisa Carney's uh, stuff today, who happens to be on our podcast. I was watching some of her stuff on Creative Live today. Really, really good stuff on colouring. Really love that. Uh, but that's it, pretty much. Um, hope that's useful. I hope you kind of find that uh, the update with the black and whites there, those presets are really, really damn good. I love that number 11 and number 12. That works really great, gives that cloudy kind of look to it. But all I suggest is when you are doing these projects, there's a couple of things. Research it online, dive into things like Pinterest and Google and really look at the pictures that you want to replicate. What is it certain things about them? You remember with the, the ones that we've done of Ian here, how we said at the start, that people never seem to look straight at the camera. They're always looking across it. So that's one little kind of characteristic of these pictures. And then the other thing was how that it wasn't deep contrasty colors. All right, it wasn't deep and contrasty. In fact, let me just show you one more thing before you go, if you've got a minute, let me just show you one extra little thing and I'll take it back to my desktop. I had somebody comment I kind of expected it really. Uh, somebody commented to say about the tie. Now, this was somebody who said he'd been in the military for 25 years and the tie wouldn't be quite as big as what you've got it there. All right, so I'll show you. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I am going to do this on my final picture because when somebody comments like that, I just have to look at it and go, all right, I'll, I'll fix that. Uh, let me just show you how I would go about fixing the tie so it's not quite so big. I'm going to go all the way down. Let's just get rid of, let's get rid of all those layers there. And I'll create a merge layer at the top of the layer stack. So for something like the tie, it would take a little bit of work to make this one smaller. Of course, the perfect way to get it smaller would have been to tie it smaller at the time of the photo shoot, but we didn't. This is one way that you could actually fix it. You could actually take this layer now into Liquify. So you can go Filter and Liquify. 
and there's a tool in there that you can use to reduce it. You might find when you've got a picture that is really kind of, there's a really big in file size. I mean, this one is already about a gig and a half at this stage. That can really cause your computer to have a bit of a heart attack and think, my God, there's a lot of work to do here, a lot of processing. So one thing you can do to help your computer out before you go into Liquify is get something like your marquee tool and just drag out a selection that includes the area you want to work on and then go to filter and liquefy. It'll then take it in and it'll allow it to work a lot quicker because it's only processing a smaller area. Then the next thing I did to, or would do rather, to reduce the size of the tie will be to go to the tools on the left-hand side of the screen. And here we've got a tool, you have to be really careful how you say this. It's called the Pucker tool, P-U-C-K-E-R the pucker tool, all right? And you can bring your uh, cursor over, you can increase or decrease the size of the actual cursor here using the left and right square bracket keys, and then you could just come in and press and hold, press and hold, press and hold, like so. And this you could use to reduce the size of the tie, get into the smaller areas, reduce the size of the brush, just reduce it using the right bracket key, or rather left bracket key, and you can see now how we can kind of really pinch it down like this, as an example. Click OK, and then all you would do is maybe look at masking it. So you'd have to come in, you'd have to apply a layer mask, get a brush, a black brush, and then you'd have to be really clever with how you're going to come in and do some masking to try and kind of hide it away or make the things kind of look a little bit better. But you can go from before and after, before and after. You might need to work on that color a little bit more, but you know, it's just a very quick one, an idea that you could use maybe to reduce the size of the tie. All right, so that's just a, a little quick one. Right, uh, I think that's probably about it. A couple of things, finish off. Uh, go back to my website. Let's have a look here, go to my site. We've got the website here. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Where is my here? Let's go to the main page just here. Okay, so today, if you haven't checked it out already, Lisa Carney is the guest on our uh, podcast, Dave Clayton and myself's podcast, He Shoots, He Draws. Lisa is the real deal. Lisa is... She is one of those people that actually works on the movie posters for movies that come out from Hollywood. An incredible, incredible retoucher, finisher, beauty retoucher. Brilliant interview. She talks about how she got into the business. She talks about failure, something close to all of our hearts, I'm sure. So it's a really good one. Check it out. He shoots, he draws.com. You'll be able to listen to it there or over on iTunes and all those kind of places. The LUT Pack, the creative LUT Pack, that is this one just here. That's coming out, like I said, a week Tuesday. I'm also going to include the look that I've created on Ian's picture here. I'll be sending out to everybody who's already signed up to my email group. I'll send that out to you this week. So you've got that as an addition. Uh, but that's pretty much it. I don't think there's anything else to kind of uh, let you know about. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, have a great weekend, whatever you're up to. Uh, I'm doing accounts tomorrow. And then I've got two photo shoots on Sunday. So whatever you're doing, have a good one. Uh, and I'll let you know when the next one will be, but there will be another live next week. Not sure what day, but there will be another live next week. But thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Chins. What a legend. Okay. <laughs> On three, one, two. All right, so this is in the video trailer on my uh, YouTube channel talking about the Westcott switch, but I thought it'd be worth just to show you kind of in person exactly what it is. Now I've got a couple of bits of kit here. I'm over at my friend uh, Ian Munro's studio, Skint Creative in Wales. We've just finished a shoot and his phone's ringing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. Oh, dear. <laughs> and then that car went by as well. Oh, that doesn't matter. We can get rid of that. That's fine. Because it's only going to pick up quite close on here. All right. Okay. See, now I'm smiling now. Hold on. You can see when someone's holding like a smile. Look at the face. Oh dear. One, two, three.
Hi, I'm Glyn Dewis and I want to let you know about my brand new book, The Photoshop Toolbox. Now Photoshop is a huge piece of software that is constantly being updated, giving the user seemingly endless creative possibilities. But being such an incredible piece of software can also make it seem confusing and difficult to master. Now the book is made up of six chapters where we start off going through the basics to fully understand layers and then we move on to layer masks, brushes, blend modes, there's some bonus content and then a full tutorial bringing everything together in a complete retouch of an image from start to finish. You see I believe that no matter how much bigger Photoshop becomes, at the heart of Photoshop are three things, layer masks, brushes and blend modes. If we can learn to understand these three areas of Photoshop, the sky really is the limit. So that's the Photoshop Toolbox, available now.